Real Life, good morning. It's so good to worship with you this morning. Wherever you are, let's sing this together. Let's sing Build My Life. Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you, Jesus Jesus, the name above every other name In Jesus the only one who could ever say worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you oh we live for you sing holy holy there is no one like you there is my eyes in wonder show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me
Hey, Real Life, welcome back to Freedom Interviews. This summer series as we have a unique format as each week I bring a different guest to talk about a particular subject. And today, uh, a true hero is gonna help us with this much needed conversation 
about racism. My special guest today actually has offices at Camp Mabry as well as Fort Hood and has been in the military for over 30 years. Uh, but I am so excited about this conversation today. Before we dive into that, if you've missed any of the interviews, please go back and check out our YouTube channel on the website, Freedom From Fear, very needed today. Uh, last week we talked about freedom from your past, a deep but very needed conversation about how to get free from whatever has hurt you in the past. It is an incredible interview if you missed it. Uh, today's no different. Uh, we've got to talk about this issue and notice our key verse, theme verse for the whole series, John chapter 8, verse 36. Here it is. What does it say? So if the sun sets you free, you are truly free. Is it possible that this verse is actually able to be applied to the issue of racism? Can we be free from our prejudice? Can we be free from stereotypes? Uh, Jesus absolutely can set us free. I'm going to ask you to turn in your Bibles of 1 Samuel 16 and 1 Peter chapter 3. And let me set up this interview with just a few biblical principles before our special guest comes on. Uh, first of all, uh, let me get a definition for racism. I'm going to put it on the screen for you as I looked at several different uh, definitions online to make this one definition for our conversation today. Racism is prejudice directed against a person based on characteristics such as physical appearance. Now, especially, uh, and this does include the color of someone's skin, economic classification or social status. Now, a lot of people have told me, um, you know, Pastor, what type of exposure have you had uh, to this issue? And, and most of you probably don't know that I moved around a lot as a child and spent my high school years in Jackson, Mississippi. As a matter of fact, the high school I went to was 87% African American. And on the basketball team, I was the only white person. And I'm very thankful for that time in my life. I was able to study black history taught by black teachers. I was able to look at a lot of the history that some schools in our country ignore or just kind of skim over. So I read Martin Luther King's sermons. I, I, I really dove into how were people treated on the issue of slavery and, and the history of that time in, in our country. The Civil War, the, 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 all the um, different struggles even after the Civil War was won and supposedly there was freedom in the South. And so I'm very thankful for that time. And, and also I experienced racism from being a minority at that school, uh, being the only white guy on the basketball team. I can remember the first time uh, that someone called me a cracker. Uh, I had to go home and ask my mom what that meant. Why did they just call me a saltine cracker? I, did, I didn't know. Uh, but I can tell you, despite all of that exposure, I still don't completely understand this issue, and that's why I've invited our special guest uh, today. And before um, I introduce him, uh, let me just give us some biblical principles about racism. And I want you to look at this verse, 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, and it says this, people judge by outward appearance. Let me tell you, racism is one of the oldest, most dangerous sins uh, in our culture, in our world, in history. And it says, watch this, the Lord looks at the heart. When, when we really put Jesus first, put the Lord first in our lives, uh, we're going to have to deal with racism, which is judging someone by the basis, remember the, our definition of their appearance, uh, their economic or social status. And so freedom from racism is accomplishing this looking at the heart of people beyond uh, their outward appearance and really loving people unconditionally and completely just like Jesus did. And so there's three steps of freedom that we're going to talk about today. And I want you just to write them down on a piece of paper and we'll come back to them after the interview. And here's the first one. How do you get free from racism? First of all, you recognize racism is a sin. You've got to know this. Just like I mentioned, it's one of the oldest, most dangerous sins in the world. It divides us it categorizes us, it reduces us to a stereotype. And this goes 
uh, color to color, uh, status to status, whatever it might be. And so instead of each of us being a unique child of God fashioned by the Lord for a special purpose, one of a kind fingerprints, uh, we just become judged by outward appearance. It's a, it's a gravest sin. Look at James chapter 2, verse 1 here on the screen. It says, you must never treat people in different ways according to their outward appearance. That's the good news translation, and it's very, very true. We cannot do that. It, it is absolutely a sin. And when you say, well, why didn't God make everybody like me? Uh, you're presuming on God uh, when you say that. Not everybody's like you. As a matter of fact, no one's like you. You are absolutely unique. On the same spectrum, uh, to say that I need to apologize for how God made me is also a sin. Uh, to say, you know, Micah, you need to apologize for being white. Well, if I did, I'm apologizing for God making me that way. I can't decide what my color is. And so you see how subtle this is. Racism is a sin. God shaped us, yes, our outward appearance in a certain way. We should look at each other's heart and from the heart uh, love each other. And so anything less than loving people conditionally and completely uh, is a sin. In other words, if I don't respect you, accept you, and I'm not kind to everyone, no matter who they are, if someone looks homeless, I need to treat them like the CEO of a company. And until we can get there, anything less than that is a sin. Number two is remember your story is not their story. This is very important. Remember your story is not their story. Everybody's got a unique story. Everybody has a story. I have a story. You have a story. And that experience, our experience, imprints on us things that we can't describe or relate to completely anyone else. In other words, if someone was born in New York City, they have a different history, a different story than somebody born on a ranch in West Texas. And so those histories matter, though. And so your story matters, and so does theirs. Look at this phrase in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. Here's the phrase, sympathize with each other. You know what that means, to sympathize with each other? It means it's not about you. You're not the center of the universe. And everybody doesn't see things like you because they're different than you. You ever heard the phrase, walk in somebody else's shoes? That's what sympathy is. And we need to walk in each other's shoes. Find out someone's story and relate to it. But listen, don't say, oh, yeah, yeah, I understand, because you don't. You do not understand someone else's story. But we need, just like Jesus did, to walk into the story and know that person, what their experiences were. And sympathy says, I want to listen. I want to learn about you. And even though I can't relate or understand a lot of what you're saying, I will treat you with respect. So your story is not their story. And here's the third one. Racism ends where love begins. Racism will end where love begins. The only way racism is going to end is when, is when we as people start loving each other like Jesus. Look back at 1 Peter chapter 3. Look at this next phrase in verse 8. Love each other as brothers and sisters. I love that. Love each other as brothers and sisters. Be tenderhearted and keep a humble attitude. And look at verse 9. Don't repay evil for evil. Don't retaliate with insults when people insult you. Instead, pay them back with a blessing. That is what God has called you to do, and he will grant you his blessing. My special guest today has definitely been blessed. Lieutenant Colonel Les Edwards, thanks so much for being here and uh, being a part of this interview. And uh, first of all, I want to thank you for your service to our nation. Um, no one understands or appreciates freedom more than the men and women who serve our country. And I know you've served our nation for over 30 years now, 19 years in active duty, uh, now with the National Guard. And so first of all, just thank you for protecting our freedom and, and our nation and serving our country. I'm really glad uh, that you're here today. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah, it's, it's my pleasure. I really appreciate it. Yeah. And, um, uh, and also, uh, thank you for just being willing uh, to talk about this subject that um, a lot of people are fighting about. Uh, there's a lot of conflict about it, but there's not a lot of conversations about it. And I really appreciate you just really telling us your story, as, as I just mentioned, just telling us uh, your story and just how um, you've seen your faith and your focus to really overcome 
a lot of struggles that uh, a lot of people even uh, watching us today can't relate to, uh, but definitely need to, to know about. And so, um, you know, uh, you just got back from Afghanistan recently. Our church uh, got you on stage, <laughs> prayed for you, uh, asked God to protect you as you protected our freedom. Uh, and we're so thankful he answered our prayers. He got you back home and, and those who were serving under you as well. And, uh, you know, um, and so how did it feel? You know, you're over in Afghanistan protecting our freedom, serving our country, and then to come back and into the, the turmoil and the kind of the division of our nation. How did it feel coming back from protecting our freedom and really watching uh, what you've experienced and kind of the um, turmoil that's happening right now? Well, I, I would tell you, Pastor, first, um, thanks um, to you and the congregation for bringing my family up. That, that was a wonderful experience, and so thank you very much for that. Um, but, but yes, it, it, was, it, was, it was challenging, um, knowing a lot of the things that we went through in Afghanistan, and, and there was some action that was going on. There's still some action going on today, but, but you know, I, I kind of bring it back just a tad bit to, I, I'm second-generation military. My dad was in the Air Force, um, retired with about 24 years in the Air Force. And so he forgave you even though you were with the army. Yeah, he did. <laughs> okay. It took a little while, but he okay. did. Okay. And so, um, but, but um, I, can, I can remember back with some of the stories and even himself, you know, he's, he was a Vietnam vet along with his brother and him and his brother was in Vietnam, served at the same time. And, but the struggles when they came back um, to, to America, for one, not only at that time, really, America didn't really accept the military. They didn't accept that we were in war uh, with the Vietnamese, um, and they didn't really understand it. So for one, coming back to your country that really didn't accept that, and then two, you're, 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 you're black coming back. So you, 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 there was a lot of challenges with wow. that. So not too late coming back to the United States that the, the, our country didn't accept that. I, I've got many appraisals and, and applause for being in the military, but coming back to America and, and as the pandemic started, there was a lot of struggles with that and a lot of issues with the pandemic. And you really didn't understand things, as we say in the military, it took kind of a, a tactical pause. And then George Floyd, his death came. So there was, you almost kind of relate those two. Um, there were some similarities with that. So there was a lot of hurdles to cover with that, a lot of hurdles to jump over. Yeah, and um, uh, thank you for taking us back to just recently, people would judge by the book of the cover of just like, hey, if you're in the military, we don't understand you, we're gonna judge you. And then, like you said, with your dad, it was, I'm gonna judge you for your uniform and I'm gonna judge you for the color of your skin. Yes. So just this, you know, so with coming back, uh, yes, we're in a pandemic with a virus, but it's almost like racism is at this pandemic point as well, where you just have that so, um, that's a really unique perspective. So, so take us back with your story. You know, you, you haven't always worn a uniform. You used to, used to just be a regular kid running around. <laughs> so, but your neighborhood uh, that you grew up in was quite a challenge. Where did you grow up? I grew up in uh, the Ninth Ward, uh, New Orleans, Louisiana. Think, the thing growing up in the Ninth Ward, it, it was very challenging. It, w it was nothing to really, uh, all black neighborhood, as you can understand that, um, I really didn't associate with, I didn't associate with people of other color. Um, we, it was nothing to walk to school and you, you, you would walk past a, a drug house. It was nothing to walk to school or go to the local store, see two grown men fighting. Um, it was nothing really to, to look outside of your house late at night. And, and my uncle classified it as like a, a, a Western movie. And, and you see a gun battle going on. Just, just folks, just. That was just a regular night. It was a regular night. Yeah. Um, and, uh, unless, th this is really important because, you know, uh, even people who don't know a lot about certain neighborhoods across the country, the Ninth Ward just has this reputation and this, you know, we just talked about stereotypes, but, you know, like, oh man, the Ninth Ward, uh, super difficult to imagine. Growing up, that's where you grew up. That's where it, you know, it was just a regular night to look out your window and you, you would see, see gunfire. You, you, would, you would see that, and, and, and again, that, like I said, it was a regular night. Um, um, and, and the thing about that, and, and, and I kid you not, the elementary school, 
in the junior high that I went to, the school's name was Lawless Elementary School. I, I, I can't make what, that up. What? Lawless. That, that's the name of the school. That was the name. Of, but it What's is the mascot. Is that, you know, I don't really, <laughs> I don't recall the mascot, but that was the name of the school. The school's been torn down because of Katrina. But, but yes, you can Google that. So you went to school. I, I'm, I'm going to Lawless. Um, that was the name of the school. I kid you not. You can't make that up. And the reason why I said it, the only time you would actually see the police in the Ninth Ward, if someone were called because of an incident or something happened, you wouldn't see them patrolling. You would just, they just wouldn't come in the neighborhood. Uh, it was such a dangerous neighborhood. And New Orleans, one, at one point in time, had the highest crime rate um, in the nation. Um, but the, the thing that really kept us going, and you and I had this conversation before, we, we understood those struggles and we understood those challenges, but the thing that kept us going was really, it was just really two things. It was love and the family. Um, well, actually three. And you talk about this, it was love and the family. There was prayer in the family. And, and there, there, was, there was whippings, there was beatings going on. <laughs> the Bible says spread a rod. So, so that. So your mom liked that verse. Yeah, my my mother didn't really do it. It was my father and my oh. grandparents. Uh, okay. uh, and, and oh wow, yeah, your grandparents get involved. Oh yeah, and and honestly speaking, the 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 neighborhood lady down the street, she would give it to you. That was oh, that was my. a common thing. Or or there would be a phone call at the house, and so hey, such and such is acting up. But but and we were gonna get it when you got home. Oh yeah, you're gonna definitely, most definitely, you'll get it. <laughs> And so, um, but there was still love. There was still love. And then you prayed out. And you prayed after. <laughs> um, I wouldn't use those tactics today. <laughs> so if my kids ever say, hey, he touched me, no, that's not the truth. But no, we wouldn't use those tactics today, but we still use love and prayer. And that was the, that was the biggest thing that kept us going. Hmm. So you're going to school in Lawless, uh, and you're in the Ninth Ward. Uh, you've already mentioned the police wouldn't show up unless... Uh, you, they, you got a 911 call that something had already happened. There was, there was no patrolling, that kind of thing. Um, you know, uh, there's what's called institutional racism. In other words, like there's, you, you just had the cards stacked against you. Um, uh, how did you overcome those kind of struggles in, in the Ninth Ward, uh, even in those days, uh, with just, you know, with where you've accomplished today? How, how did you do that? Well, we, 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 we knew, first and foremost, our parents and grandparents didn't allow us to like feel sorry for yourself. We knew the conditions that, that was there, and, and as nowadays we say, hey, it is what it is. And that, that was kind of, it is what it is. But we looked at, and, and as a kid, my brother and my cousins and I, you know, we, we, we knew we had to have education and, and, and trying to get to the next level. So some of my challenges is, is when I actually moved to Texas. And his last assignment was, was in San Antonio, Lackland Air Force Base. And so we moved out to Texas, uh, moved from the Ninth Ward. And, and you got to understand the, the, the big picture of it. The only time I would see a person of, of, of a different color, if we would call it uptown, uh, if we would go uptown, um, a lot of folks under, knows the French quarters and, and a lot of folks know all everything that's down there has to offer so we would go uptown to shop so the french quarter is uptown for it, we, that's what we call it uptown not down you know go downtown we would call it uptown new orleans is a little bit different and so we have our own language over there and, and that's the yeah. piece i want to talk to you about good beignets, we have good beignets you got to eat the beignets <laughs> you go there uh cafe de Monde. so um um so so we would go uptown and that's really the only time uh, we would see a, a person of, of color, a, a diff, different color. It's the only time we would see white people. And, but everyone kind of stayed to their own because everyone would eat and, and, and laugh, talk, or whatever. And then when, literally when the lights would go down, you would go to your corner, I would go to mine, go back to the Ninth Ward, and, and that's how we lived. And so a lot of the struggles really started with me is, is uh, we moved to Texas. Yeah. I want to get to Texas in a second. Let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. So you're in the Ninth Ward. Uh, the only time you see white people is when you go uptown. Um, what was your perception of white people, if you will? Because you're with, like you said, the Ninth Ward is, is all African American. So uh, how, how did you think about, view, uh, look at, 
uh, what prejudices may, you know, how did you see the people that lived uptown, let's say it that way? Um, you, you know, you, you can, you looked at things, um, you can kind of see the have and have nots, but the way we were raised, um, we didn't, our parents didn't raise us underneath prejudice. Um, and, and so that's why, and we'll talk about it in a few minutes, but that's why some of the struggles, we, we didn't really look at color. We, we, we looked at, we understand the, stood the conditions, um, the, the houses that, that where my, I lived with my grandparents and it was nothing really to roaches crawling around. You're sitting there eating in, 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 a, in a big size rat or so. That, that, was, that was the life we lived. And we understood that and we, we just accepted those things. Um, and we, again, we kind of knew the half and half not, but th there wasn't a sense that, um, you know, we felt sorry for ourselves because our parents didn't allow that. It, it's like, this is the conditions and what are you as an individual going to do about it? And, and, and trying to break that mold, so to speak. But, but, uh, but again, uh, I, I don't feel sorry for those things because I still teach my kids and we go back to New Orleans for, from the roots of where I'm from. And I, I'm a proud uh, um, Saints fan, proud. I, I say, hey, who that? Even in the military, when, when, when my, my bio, as it reads on a native of New Orleans, Louisiana, that's still part of me. Wow. Um, yeah, I, that's your story. That is and my story. And you should be proud of it. Yes. I mean, you, you know, you were from the Ninth Ward. Yeah. Really, it's when you moved to Texas that you started to feel some of that tension. Yes. Um, and so describe that uh, going to Texas. Moving to Texas, my, my language was different. The, the way I spoke, um, we didn't necessarily pronounce the words right or correct, but in, in our eyes, we did. Yeah, and they weren't pronouncing the words. It, yeah, yeah, we <laughs> it were. It was just different. It was different. <laughs> um, and there's at times when um, I, I struggled. And, and even I can recall once, I, and it kind of makes me makes teary-eyed now, I can recall um, when I was in class. They moved me to the back of the class um, because my reading level and comprehension level wasn't at the same level as the other kids. And, and I, I, felt, I felt so embarrassed for one, and I, and I felt like I wasn't up to their standard. And I would go home and I would cry to my mother, and I was like, hey, they put me in the back of the class. And, and they made me feel this small, um, like I'm not one of them. And, and typically, and, and it just, the percentage when you go to a school, any type of class, and even in the military classes, if you, got, if you have about 30 kids in the class, typically it's only about, what, 2% black that's in there. And you, so you look at the numbers, and, and I can recall, maybe it's only me, maybe one other black person that was in the class, but I was in the back of the class, and I, and, and I had to read other books. I wasn't, and it, and it made me feel so bad, and, 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 and I was like, Mom, I'm, I'm just as good as they are. Why is this, and why is that? And the thing that my mother didn't, she didn't pat me on the back and say, it's okay, and, and so forth, but what she said, we will get through this. And we're going to read more. And, and so she would work with me. She would help me read and comprehension. That's what we did. We, we recognized what the problem was. It wasn't sure I, I, I felt like um, I, I was uh, being uh, um, neglected or I felt like I was being a prejudice against. But, but we looked at the root cause of the problem. It was my, my reading level. It was, it was my education level. And so those things I, I had to, to get over. Um, but, but yes, but there were still struggles um, because, as we say, birds of a feather flock together. And when you, you don't look like that next person. And those are the struggles we actually face, as, as we'll say, as being black in America. And, and, and the George Floyd and all those things, um, there are struggles, regardless if, if you have a, a reading issue or not. It's just the fact that sometimes when you go into a room and, and there's, there might be 15 white individuals and you're the only black guy, you're the one that stands out. And, and so that's always a struggle that's there. And at the end of the day, you, you know, and I don't want to get into that subject, but are we looking at changing, trying to change history and taking down the statues? But to me, it's not about that. To me, it's about what's in your heart. That's where it is. And, and like I said, we, we understood the struggles back in New Orleans, but my parents didn't allow us 
to feel for that. And when we would go out, we understood when we go uptown, we understood what they had, but I wasn't envy of, of that. I knew what I had, but I knew, okay, I would like that. What do I have to do to get that? And that means working hard. That means uh, um, getting your education. And, and those are the things. The military kind of lines it out for you. You, you got to do this, you got to do that to be successful. And part of it too is, you know, it's on your own. But, but going back to the school piece, um, it, it was tough. Um, I mean, sometimes I, 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 I felt like uh, even on the playgrounds, you know, it's, you know, trying to play with the others. And some of the, the individuals that maybe that uh, I, I, I linked with at first were, were kind of individuals that were maybe somewhat like me. And I'm just going to say that I don't want to offend, offend anyone, but or maybe some of the, the, the trailer park kids that were on the outside as well. Those became my friends because we, we weren't like the rest. And that was a reality. But again, um, I can't change what's in a person's heart, but I can look at things and say, okay, that, that guy, he, he's a hard worker. Um, he's educated. Uh, he has love for his family. All those great things. He's a Christian and he, he loves the Bible. Those things. And, and so those are kind of the, the cornerstone of, of what I, I see that uh, my parents wanted for me. Yeah. So I can tell you what you had. Mm -hmm. You had a great mom. Yeah. Because <laughs> you get, get to the back of the room. How old were you when you went to the back of that, that Texas transition? That year, I was in eighth grade that okay. year. That's a big year yeah. uh, for anybody. I mean, middle school's tough. Yeah, <laughs> so, so 12, 13-ish. Yeah. And so... Um, I remember like it was yesterday. Well, I can tell. And so you go, and you just go home and say, Mom, you know, they put me in the back of the room. And that, that feeling, like you said, and then that, that 2%... Uh, number you gave and then you see you no know, uh, and even now when you walk into a room and like man there's you know I'm, I'm the only one of my color yeah it, 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 it if you're not careful it can take you back to that feeling yeah. uh, of that and um, how have you overcome that because I can tell it's real for you and you feel it but there's not a um, uh, animosity about that and there's not a um, uh, anger about that it's more just you know hey I'm gonna take this struggle um, and your mom was able to not say that was okay but to help you identify how you were gonna overcome it so how have you overcome that you you as an individual again you can't feel sorry for yourself um, and I teach that with my kids my parents taught that to me um, you can't feel as if society owes you anything um, you have to do what you have to do and, and you have to define success, whether if it's, I want to get an a, a undergraduate degree, master's degree, or you know what, I just want to get a certificate, I want to be a welder or, or whatever. I want to feed my family. If that's what you find success, that's what you have to do. Uh, but cause you can't let others steal your joy because racism, I think, will always be there. Racism and, and prejudice will always be there. Racism is always going to be there because sin is always going to be there. Um, tell me about the military, how it, one, how it helped you, two, maybe even some of the struggles there. You've already kind of mentioned that even in the military, when you walk in, um, you maybe, you know, feel those same feelings you did when you moved to Texas when you were 12 years old. Yes. Um, and, you know, when I, I joined the military, you know, second generation in the military, and, and I, I've loved it. Um, but the military, just like any other, any other organization, it has its struggles, it has its challenges. Um, but you, but, but you, 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 you are promoted based upon your potential. And, and so that portion of it, you have to keep moving forward. And your potential at the next rank, can you hold that next grade? So, but there are struggles. You, you go into a class and you look at it and again, um, the percentages are, are not there. You know, again, 30, 30 officers in a class, um, and, and there might be a, a two to five percent that are minorities, and and you you have to make your way through. So it's always been that, um, but you know, I, I I'm proud of the, the success I've, I've had um, becoming a, a lieutenant colonel. Um, it's the foundation that I I, I, I came underneath. Um, like I said, uh, love and prayer. And, and hard work. Um, so no, it, th that's and, and that's one thing that I, I am proud of with, with the military because 
Um, yes, uh, you have to put in the work, uh, especially the, based upon the things that we do. Um, it, it, it could be fatal if, if you do not put in the hard work. But, but no, those success rates and, um, that I, I look at, uh, and really my, my background is, is, is love for the next person. And, and I've always kind of looked at a lot of times, if you, if you take care of the soldiers, if you take care of um, the organization, the organization will take care of you. But, but, but th that's not saying, you know, the end justifies the means, not trying to, trying to say that, but, but that's just the type of person I am. And those are the things that come, again, from my heart and, and knowing to do the right thing. But, but it, to answer your question, it's, it's just bottom line, it's hard work yeah. um, to try to be successful. Yes, yeah, definitely the heart. Um, and that's what we were talking about today, that God looks at the heart. You work on your heart. You look at the heart of the next person. And you share with me how you've been able to take the struggles from the Ninth Ward to Texas to struggles with education, uh, all of these things that we've talked about. And now you're able to use those struggles and encourage the men and women that serve under you. And I know there's different numbers at different times, but many times you have over 500 soldiers who are reporting directly to you, which says a lot for your leadership. How have you been able to use your struggles to turn around and help uh, the next generation with, with their own struggles? You know, a lot of the things, and I see young junior officers coming through the ranks and, and young NCOs, non-commissioned officers coming through the ranks. And, and you know, we, we just, we, I just try, I'm at that point where I do a lot of uh, mentoring and developing. And life in general is a battle, and, and, um, but you gotta keep moving forward. I had one of, one of my mentors, one of the general officers would always tell me, keep your head down and your legs moving. And, and I, I remember that like it was yesterday, and, and that's a true statement. You gotta keep moving. You gotta keep moving, there's gonna be hurdles. And you just have to figure out how to get over that hurdle. Either get over it or get around it. Because if, if, if you stop, you, you, you know, you, for lack of better words, lack of better terms, you, you're pretty much gonna die in place. Everything's gonna pass you by. So you gotta figure out how to get over it. And so I, I try to relay those things, uh, being a mentor to some of those individuals, and, some of the success, and I, and I share stories about my family. I'm so proud of my family, uh, my, my kids, uh, their mother. I'm, I'm proud of every last one of them. So I share some of the success that they've had as well. So how many times when you are addressing the troops, talking to your soldiers, mm -hmm. do you find yourself quoting your mom? Um, <laughs> I, you know, I, 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 I do, um, and sometimes, I, quite a bit. Um, I even, at times, I, I quote things out of the Bible. It, it just comes to me. Sometimes your, I, I kind of... But your mom did, too. Yeah, yeah. I, it did. And sometimes I may kind of mess up the verbiage, but I have to Google it and say, wait a minute, yeah, I said that right. And even now, and my kids know, um, I would text them, uh, you, know, you know how everybody say, hey, it's hump day, you know, hey, it's hump day, and so forth. But sometimes I may text, uh, 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 one of my favorite texts is, Today is the day that the Lord may be happy and be glad, or something of that nature. That's one of, one of the things that text the, the family. Um, but I, I do speak with soldiers about some of the things my mother would, would tell me and, and teach me. And I would tell you, we had, as a kid, we would have Bible study in our house every Wednesday. Every Wednesday afternoon. And I would play the drums and we would sing and stuff like that. This is in your home. This is in my house. Yeah, and, 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 and on top of going to church. My, both my parents, my, my, my father was a deacon in the church, um, and, and my mother, she sang in a choir and played the tambourine. My grandmother, she played the organ. My uncle, he played the guitar. So our family, and we were singing, I, I can't sing, but family was a singing family and, and playing the church. My, my brother out in California, him and his wife, they, they sing in the choir. So, so that background of it, but um, going, back to your, going back to that, uh, my mother, when again going back to she would teach us, uh, um, we, I had to learn all 50 states, uh, uh, states and capitals. So that was the thing. I was like, Mom, I got to learn the states and capitals, and so it, it was a struggle learning that. And so what she did, she said, "Okay, I'll help you, but here's one additional piece." And I was like, oh, "Okay, here we go." I was like, "What's that?" And she said, "Well, you have to learn the books of the Bible as well." I said, "What?" 
She said, you have to learn the books of the Bible. Oh, by the way, there's Old Testament and there's New Testaments. I said, Mom, don't you understand? I just said I got to do the 50 states. And she said, oh, we, we, we'll do it. Yeah. But You can do 50 states, you can do 66 books. Yes. <laughs> and what's so funny about it, um, as we learn that, and again, how sometimes scriptures just pop in my head, um, I still remember uh, a little bit of the books of the Bible, uh, how they're, how they're uh, laid out. It's because that, that's what we did. And, and, and coming in New Orleans now, um, my dad was Southern Baptist, and my mother, um, her church was, was Holy Christian, where, you know, you'd get up in the church and sing in, in the Holy oh, yeah. Ghost. You're not going to fall asleep. Oh, no, no. It, it's, it's a party. Let me tell you that. It's a party. <laughs> Singing and everything else. So I lived that life for years. So that's the, the books of the Bible and scriptures would come to me because that's, that was me and, and that was part of my, my life and, and what I knew. So when you talk about the prejudice of folks, that it's just, again, like I said, it's a sin. Um, um, being a racist and, and being prejudiced is a sin. So that's why that really wasn't part of my life. I understand uh, that. Yeah. But you know what? Hey, I, I got, that's your upbringing. I have nothing nothing against that and 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 um you know again as a scripture love thy neighbor as thyself so my neighbors if he's if he's a uh, a racist or so the bible still says love him i don't have to go and eat with him but um it says love thy neighbor as thyself wow. so um but that was the back the the, the background and, and understanding of those it's really powerful Les. racism ends where love begins and you learn that love by your parents, uh, the, those marathon Sundays at church. Um, and, you know, when you are introduced to Jesus young, have faith as your foundation, have love as the mandate. Like you said, that's not the issue. We, and, and racism in many ways is learned. There are some individuals that because of what they went through, they do have a chip on their shoulder um, because they, they went through some of the struggles I went through. And, and so now, you know, the world is after me or the world hates me or, or, or this white individual hates me. I don't have that chip on my shoulder because it was love. Um, if a guy, you know, and my mother would always, and I go back to my mother, the things she would say, you know what, we're going to pray for him. And I was like, Mom, how's that going to help me out? But she would always say that. Okay, you know, let's, let's pray. And we would really stop. I'm like, can I eat? I'm going to give some. No, 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 let's pray. Right? You, you brought a problem to me, so let's pray. And so that's, that's, at the end of the day, that's what it is. Because she had love in her heart, and, and, um, and God, my, my, both my parents are deceased now, but, uh, but that is still there. But, but, but I think it's, it's, it's love. And, and how do you as an individual what are you going to be like next year and a year after next? When things are, you're, you're back to somewhat normal. Uh, and you kind of go back into your own routine and, and don't really understand the struggles and, and not looking at it? Or are you going to like, you know, I'm still going to march forward to help out the individuals or help out the people that are, are less fortunate um, and, and do what I can or do my part? It's powerful, less Love. Racism ends where love begins and the big challenge which i appreciate you giving us is is not just choosing love right now when an issue is heightened but choosing love next year uh, choosing a love that doesn't run out and that's why we've gathered as a church family because only the love of christ never runs out it's unconditional it's complete and it's always going to be there and that's the kind of love we need to have for each other and i just want you to know less as your pastor, I'm proud of you. I'm proud of a guy coming from the Ninth Ward to where you've accomplished in the military and just all that you've accomplished in life through all your struggles. And let me just tell you, I don't understand everything you've been through, but I really respect how you have navigated it and your mom's faith passing on to you and your parents' discipline and prayer and love uh, to really challenge all of us today uh, in this very sensitive but needed uh, discussion. And I'm just so thankful that there didn't have to be conflict around it. We can just have a conversation. And, and if that conversation's in love, it's going to change. It's going to change 
everything. And so thank you for making our church family stronger and better because of you sharing your story today. And, um, and this pastor, we're thankful that our prayers were answered getting you back home. And, uh, and we're thankful to see how the love of Christ is not just going to change uh, these things we've talked about, but really keep changing uh, not just Texas, but the world through the love of Christ. And, uh, and Les, I'm really thankful you're my brother. I'm thankful. God, God bless you. I'm, I'm, thanks for being here today. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, Pastor. What a powerful story. You know, as you are watching this today and hearing Les's story, I, I, I just want it to become crystal clear to us that racism ends where love begins. And we just heard just how powerful that statement is when you apply it. Les, thanks for telling us your story. Remember the principles I started with today, that racism is a sin. And I'm so thankful that, that Les wasn't taught prejudice, so he didn't live it. I wasn't taught prejudice. I, don't, I didn't live it. Uh, but we need to be super careful and very aware of this sin, that we never judge anyone by their outward appearance, whether it's the uniform they wear, or it's the color of their skin, or it's the status of their um, e economic condition, uh, where they are from, from the Ninth Ward to Westlake. And so get to know their story. And I don't know about you, but getting to know Les's story makes me appreciate him more, uh, helps me to, to sympathize more, but also uh, it brings a lot of admiration and appreciation uh, and, and respect to his accomplishments of what he has been able uh, to do in his life. And, and just remember, again, love is the powerful tool. Real life, don't miss this today. I don't know where you're sitting with your experience with racism, maybe feeling like people are judging you because of your outward appearance, uh, or maybe you realizing, you know what? I have some prejudices I need to deal with and some stereotypes I need to get rid of. But either way, listen to me carefully. Jesus sets you free. Remember our theme verse. If the Son sets you free, you are truly free. Real life, Jesus not only took care of sin on that cross, Jesus killed racism when he died on that cross. Because what he said is, is everyone is worth it. Everyone is valuable. And my blood is for all tribes of all nations, of all races, for all people on the planet. For God so loved, not a certain segment of people, but the world. And that is the love that we have to show. And so in order to show that love, we have to experience it. And I tell you, you're going to deal with prejudice and racism your whole life until you experience the love of Jesus. And would you let him love you today? I don't know who you are, where you've been, what you've done, what you drive, where you live, or the color of your skin, but God looks on your heart today and he loves you. And would you turn your heart over to him? Would you find the same fate that Les has found, that I've found, that makes us brothers in Christ? And all of us are in God's family. Look at this verse, Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. It says, all of you are God's children because of your faith in Christ Jesus. The ground is level at the cross. And at the cross, the scripture tells us, there's no Jew or Gentile, slave or free. Uh, there's, we're, all, we're all loved children of God. And so let's right now pray and receive that love. Would you pray with me right now? Uh, Heavenly Father, thank you so much uh, for this time. Lord, all of us needed to hear this story. Uh, God, all of us uh, are looking for how to help with this issue. And God, I pray that we would take less as challenge, God, that we would, would love each other. Uh, it's the challenge of Jesus, God, to, to look past the outward appearance and, and truly treat people with respect. Hear their story and sympathize with each other. God, I want to ask, Lord, that you would infuse uh, the church known as real life as, as a family, a spiritual family of faith that, that looks beyond our differences and embraces the unity we have around Jesus. Jesus, thank you for dying for all of us. And because of that cross, we can love each other and be set free from racism and prejudices. And we can appreciate our differences instead of fighting about them. Lord, thank you 
that racism ends where love begins, that conflict ends where conversations begin. And I pray, Lord, that uh, we would realize that we need to love everybody who's different than us. And it doesn't take much to find somebody different than us because everybody's different than us. And may the love of Christ flow into the hearts of everyone who's watching this right now. May we open up our hearts and lives to you. Lord, forgive us where we have had prejudices. God, forgive us where we have stereotyped people. God, forgive us uh, if we've been taught racism, Lord, and we just lay it down at the cross. And God, we take up the love of Jesus and help us to see everybody today, tomorrow, and next year through the lens of love. For we ask this in the name of the one who taught us that love and showed us that love on the cross and gave us the power to love through the resurrection, Jesus Christ. And everybody said, amen. I know you've really appreciated this interview today, and I'm going to ask your real life to respond in a couple of ways. First, please continue to give. In these summer months, uh, you guys have been so generous. Thank you for leaning in. Uh, I know some are not able to give, but if you are able to give, would you help us? Uh, so many people need this hope, and you're helping us get the message of love and hope to so many people who need it. So thank you guys for being generous. You can give online through the app, even the QR code scanned on the screen. But I want to thank you guys for continuing to be generous and helping us help those who are struggling in these desperate times and, and uh, confusing times and uncertain times, uh, but also just getting messages like this to those who desperately need to know there is hope and way beyond the news or anything reported, there is love. And, and we are all brothers and sisters in Christ who've put our faith uh, in Jesus. And so I'm also going to ask you to make sure that you're checking your campus's Facebook uh, for when you're going to gather again face to face and those options uh, coming up in Corpus uh, somewhere around the middle of August for Austin. Cannot wait to have that option to gather again real life. God bless you guys and love someone who's different than you this week and let's change the world. I'll see you next week. <laughs>